Good afternoon. Thank you. All right. Open any book or read any website on the Pony Express, and you'll learn that it was a fast horse relay system that delivered mail between St. Joseph, Missouri and Sacramento, California. Riders carried lightweight loads, small loads of lightweight mail, and they changed horses at swing stations every 15 miles. They ended each run at a home station where they passed the mail on to the next rider to carry forward. The service lasted for 18 months, from April 1860 to October 1861, and was put out of business by the completion of the Transcontinental Telegraph. Read further, and you might learn that the Pony Express proved that mail could be delivered over the Rocky Mountains through South Pass, even during winter, that its horses were exceptionally strong, swift, and sure-footed, and that all employees swore an oath not to drink, swear, or fight upon pain of immediate dismissal. You might even learn that riding for the Pony Express was so dangerous, an ad calling for riders specified orphans preferred, that Buffalo Bill was the most famous rider, and that the service bankrupted its owners, Russell Majors and Waddell, the giant freighting firm. But the owners had no regrets. They had set up the Pony Express knowing it would lose money and were willing to incur that loss in order to help save the United States by keeping California and its gold tied to the northern states on the eve of the Civil War. At least, that's what we're told. <laughs> the statements on the first slide are mostly true, but with qualifications. For instance, the Pony Express delivered mail in 10 days, except when it didn't. <laughs> statements on the second slide are exaggerations. Mail had been delivered over South Pass through winter for a decade before the Pony Express came along. And the statements on the third slide are all myths. No orphan's preferred ad ever ran. Buffalo Bill never rode for the Pony Express, and Russell Majors and Waddell set up the service for no higher purpose than to create a monopoly on transportation west of the Missouri River. That's not to say there isn't a lot to love. My point here isn't to criticize the Pony Express, but the cult of Pony Express warship that has caused successive generations of riders to keep repeating these same platitudes. I've been a fan of the Pony Express since before I can remember, probably like many of you, and I don't really know why. But I think it has a lot to do with that image of the lone rider and the horse galloping across the landscape. Whatever the reason, as soon as I heard someone had created a Pony Express bikepacking route that stuck as close to the trail as possible, I knew I had to ride it, even though I'd never been bikepacking before. I completed my ride, completed my ride in summer 2021, and I made a series of videos for Okta, which are currently playing on Okta's YouTube channel. You can find them there. They tell the details of my ride in far more detail than I could ever cover in the 40 minutes I have here. So what I want to do today is to take you on a virtual bikepacking tour of the Pony Express with a few stops along the way to talk about the nuggets of truth that lie hidden under the tailings piles of mist that have accrued over the years. It took me 35 days to ride my bike from St. Joseph to Salt Lake City, and that's only two thirds of the trail. I've got, well, about 35 minutes left to get us to California, so it's going to be a quick tour. I started my ride from the Pony Express stables in St. Joseph, and everything went fine for the first 10 miles or so until I, I left the pavement west of Wathena, Kansas. It had rained the day before, and I proceeded to get myself stuck in the mud twice. First time wasn't too bad. I was able to turn around. The second time, I plowed deep into it until I came to a dead stop. I had to unhook my trailer and carry my bike, trailer, and gear back up to solid ground in three trips. On one trip, a woman had come out from her farmhouse and asked if I needed help. And I said, no, I'll be fine, thank you. But by the time I came up uh, with the gear on my third trip, she was crouched down next to my bike, digging mud out of the frame with a butter knife she'd retrieved from her kitchen. <laughs> she told me that cars, well, Trucks, because I think everyone in the West drives a truck, but trucks got stuck there all the time. Now, I live in California, and I sail in San Francisco Bay. And many of you may know the bay is actually very shallow, mostly due to hydraulic mining during the, during the gold rush era. Well, we have a saying that there are two types of bay sailors, those who have run aground and those who will admit it. And I kind of got the impression <laughs> the same was true about Northeast Kansas drivers. <laughs> Three days into my ride, I made it to Marysville, Kansas. In the center of Marysville sits a Pony Express Plaza, which is dominated by
by a massive bronze sculpture, said to be the largest of its kind in the Midwest, and captures perfectly the most exciting element of the Pony Express in the 1860, and that's speed. And the Pony Express was fast. It delivered mail in half the time of the Butterfield Overland, which up to that point had been the fastest service. It was also believed that horses raced between stations and that riders relied on them to outrun any Native American pursuers. Now, California newspapers grabbed hold of this, this notion of speed with both hands, and they, they, elevated, they elevated the flesh and blood pony to a semi-mythic beast. One newspaper talked about the hippogriff who shoved the continent under its heel so easily. And another paper asked whether the rider's brass buttons hadn't turned black from the sulfur fumes the pony must have kicked up. <laughs> well, first of all, what even is a hippogriff? You Harry Potter fans know. <laughs> you recognize him as Buckbeak. For the rest of us, it's a legendary animal that's half eagle and half horse. But really, does that even matter? I mean, you get the point, right? It's, it's Pony Express horse is another order of being. Well, Alexander Majors, one of the owners of Russell Majors and Waddell, wrote his autobiography 30 years after the Pony Express went out of business. And in that book, he added to this super pony mystique by writing that he and his partners stocked the line with 500 of the best horses money could buy. But despite all the hype, there was nothing special about Pony Express horses. First off, they didn't race between stations. They kept, according to Pony Express historian Joe Nardoni, they kept a pace between 8 to 12 miles per hour at a lope or a trot. Coincidentally, that's about the same pace I kept on my bike on this trip. And I can tell you after 1,400 miles, it's not that fast. <laughs> as for outrunning Native American pursuers, it wasn't the pony's superior speed so much as it was its better diet. Butterfield Overland had been running stagecoaches across the Southwest since 1858. And its drivers found that, that their grain-fed horses would outlast the less well-nourished Native American ponies, even while carrying a fully loaded coach. And as for the best horses money could buy, the ad that the firm placed in the paper only specified that the horses be, quote, well broke and warranted sound. They bought most of them from the quartermaster of Fort Leavenworth, and they paid the going market rate. And even if the horses at the beginning were somehow, you know, above level, above standard, as time went on and they wore out, they were replaced by increasingly wilder horses, which were neither well broke nor warranted sound. One rider even mentioned riding a mule on some runs. Still, Speed was the feature that most impressed the public, and it's celebrated perfectly here in this statue. And, you know, let's face it, it's good PR, because who would be impressed or inspired <laughs> by a slouching cowboy just moseying along? <laughs> On my fourth day, I entered Nebraska, crossed into Nebraska. And here's the thing about Nebraska. It has a sense of humor. Who knew? I didn't. <laughs> I came across this COVID vaccination ad not far from here near Morrill. I thought that was pretty good. And, and the uh, tourism motto that year was, honestly, it's not for everyone. <laughs> I mean, you have to love a state with that level of self-awareness. <laughs> Nebraska drivers, they're as polite as any I came across on the trail, but they have a couple of quirks. First of all is the Nebraska wave. Anyone recognize this? <laughs> That's Nebraska way, one finger off the steering wheel, right? <laughs> and, and for all their courtesy, Nebraska drivers seem to have no concept of how much dust a three-quarter ton truck can kick up going 50 miles an hour down a gravel road. So I'd be riding along, and a truck, because everyone in the Midwest drives a truck, would be coming the other way, and the driver would move over to the right, give me the one finger wave, and he would slow down not one bit. And as a result, I got thoroughly redusted every time. I wondered, really, if any of them ever looked in their rearview mirror and noticed I disappeared. <laughs> Thirteen days into my ride, I made it to North Platte, Nebraska, the birthplace of the Pony Express. Not the historical 1860 Pony Express, but the action figure image that we all know and love today. And that's because Buffalo Bill's house, Scout's Rest, is in North Platte. And no one did more to create, develop, and profit from the Pony Express myth than Buffalo Bill Cody. He started his Wild West show in 1883. It toured America and Europe for 30 years, and it was the most popular traveling show of its era. And one of its most popular features was a Pony Express mochila, mochila exchange segment. 
listen to this description. Before an audience of thousands, a horseman raced down to the grandstand, checked his pony within a length, and almost before it was at a standstill, the man was on the ground, the bag on another horse, and the man galloping off at full speed. In less time, in less than the time, it would take an ordinary man to dismount. Now, many of you were probably at the conference last year in Casper, and some of you may have made it down to, to see the uh, Motilla Exchange uh, demonstration at Fort Casper. It was somewhat less heart pounding than that description there. I'll give you a little <laughs> view of it here. <laughs> Not quite the same, right? <laughs> But, <laughs> right? We all loved it. We all loved it. So you can imagine how much more exciting it would have been to see these horses with you know, thundering hooves and swirls of dust galloping in and out. In the words of two historians, it was a showstopper. No one ever forgot it. Well, a few years before Buffalo Bill started his Pony Express show, he wrote his autobiography. And in that book, he padded his resume in part by claiming to have been a Pony Express rider and to have ridden 322 miles when he showed up at the home station to find that his relief rider had been killed in a drunken row the night before. Now, there are some very knowledgeable people, including highly respected members of Okta, who I should probably be careful not to piss off. <laughs> but they will admit that most it might be possible to argue that Buffalo Bill may not have ridden for the Pony Express. I disagree. Uh, what I've read convinced me he never rode for the service. But there is a nugget of truth at, at the heart of his tales. Buffalo Bill rode as a messenger for Russell Majors and Waddell. His route was a three-mile radius around Leavenworth, Kansas, and he held that job for two months in 1857, three years before the Pony Express started. He was 11 years old. <laughs> Nevertheless, his stories from his autobiography made it into the first couple of books written about the Pony Express, which were published in the early 1900s. Those stories have been repeated ever since, so that over time, these undocumented tales have become accepted truths, much the same way that that thrill-packed Bochilla exchange segment of the Wild West show grew from being an entertainment spectacle to being a historical reenactment. But even though I don't believe a 14-year-old Buffalo Bill rode 322 miles for the Pony Express, I still had to tip my helmet to the old scout as I passed, because I, even though I didn't know it at the time, it was his dime store novel version of the Pony Express that had set me on the path. I'm going to make fun of Nebraska again, so. No, really, you ride your bike across Nebraska, and you wonder, how windy can it get? Then you get to Wyoming and you find out. <laughs> uh, geologist Keith, Keith Heyer Medall calls wind the tyrant king of Wyoming. Now listen to his description. 50 pound sandbags weight the bottoms of rest area trash cans. Without them, the big steel cans bounce away like styrofoam cups. Forlorn cows endure a lifetime of wind, joylessly converting the sparse grass of the plains into meat until slaughter brings relief. Legends tell of people driven to murderous insanity by the wind. That's Wyoming. At least a sonar to buck its headwinds for 400 miles. I mean, bikes normally coast downhill. You know, I think it's a principle of physics. But there were two places in the Pony Express Trail where that didn't happen. One was through deep sand in Nevada. And the other was on pavement in Wyoming, trying to ride into the teeth of a Wyoming wind. It was brutal. So three weeks out from St. Joseph, I made it to Fort Laramie, Wyoming. There's a Pony Express station somewhere in the area, but no one knows exactly sure where. Still, this is a good place to talk about Pony Express riders. Like the legendary horses, the riders of the Pony Express became legendary men. They were morally superior, uncommonly tough, and dauntlessly brave. A typical passage describes them as, quote, clean, God-fearing, worthy of trust, and, more, and honest. No, clean, God-fearing, worthy of trust, and modest in the extreme. Yeah, it was close. Another writer tells us, 
that the dangers of the way led men of less stout hearts to stay off the road. The claims to the, the writer's moral superiority stems from the belief, oh, I thought that was me, <laughs> stems from the belief that all Pony Express riders swore the oath I referred to above, not to drink, swear, or fight, and also that they all received a miniature Bible. It's, it's well documented that when Alexander Majors had his own freighting company, he did administer the oath and distribute the Bibles to his bullwhackers. And it's also true that he carried that practice to the freighting teams when he helped form Russell Majors and Waddell. But Alexander Majors had very little to do with the Pony Express. By the time the service came along, he was running Russell Majors and Waddell's freighting teams from Nebraska City, 100 miles north of St. Joseph. According to Joan Ardoni again, quote, there is scant evidence that any Pony Express riders received a Bible. Now, in his autobiography, Alexander Majors wrote that he never knew of any employee ever discharged for violating his oath. But contemporary observers noted and wrote this down. They noted that Majors' employees cursed as much as any other stagecoach driver or bullwhacker. Archaeological excavations of two Pony Express stations in Nevada unearthed hundreds of pieces of broken alcohol bottles. <laughs> and as for promising not to fight, there were two shooting incidents at Smith Creek Station in 1860. In one, the station master shot at a rider. And in another, a different rider shot another man, resulting in the first judicial hanging in Nevada. And remember Buffalo Bill? He wrote that he had to ride 322 miles because his relief rider had been killed in a drunken row. So I don't know, maybe he would have been fired if he hadn't died. <laughs> On a similar note, someone made up the fictitious Pony uh, Orphans Preferred ad decades after the Pony Express ended, mostly as a tribute to the rider's bravery and, and toughness. But like the statue in Marysville, this is really an evocative depiction, not a historical artifact. I'm certain that young, skinny, wiry orphans who are willing to risk death daily were welcome to apply. These attributes weren't required. In fact, one could argue that compared to other trans-Missouri mail carriers of the era, the Pony Express riders were the prima donnas of the overland mail. I mean, think about it. Station masters took care of their horses. They saddled them. They even led them out for the riders. All the rider had to do was jump on the horse, give a high ho silver, trot 10 or 15 miles down the next station where there'd be another horse waiting for him. Riders could look forward to coffee and biscuits at swing stations along the way, and then three hops in a cot at the home station when they finished their run. And if a rider's horse died or was lamed, he could throw the mochilla over his shoulder, and the farthest he might have to walk would be maybe 10 miles. And that was if he couldn't flag down a stagecoach, which one rider did. So, was riding for the Pony Express dangerous work? Absolutely. And did it take a measure of bravery and grit? No question. But this is one area where I think the Pony Express fan club goes a step too far. Because in shining a spotlight on Pony Express riders, it casts all other mail carriers of the era into shadow. And I think it's a disservice to those who probably risked as much and probably suffered more just to see the mail through. Fun fact, Wyoming has more sagebrush than any other state. <laughs> Unofficially, it has the fewest shade trees, at least along the Pony Express bikepacking route. The Pony Express Trail crosses the Continental Divide at South Pass, which sits in the middle of Wyoming sagebrush steppe, which is known for its harsh winters. When William Russell of Russell Majors and Waddell set up the Pony Express, he set it up to prove two things. One, that he could deliver mail faster through South Pass, even during winter. And two, that he could maintain that schedule even through winter. Why? Because William Russell wanted Russell, Majors, and Waddell to dominate the transportation of passengers, mail, and freight west of the Missouri River. And to do so, he had to prove he could outperform the premier stagecoach and mail service of the day, the Butterfield Overland Mail. Butterfield had an ironclad six-year contract with the United States to deliver mail between the Mississippi River and California, and carried with it a $600,000 a year subsidy. That's $22 million a year in today's numbers, far greater than any other overland mail subsidy of the day. Russell wanted to take over Butterfield's contract when it expired, 
and also to talk Congress into upping the subsidy to a million dollars or more. The problem is that Butterfield service was virtually unassailable. From its first run in September 1858, its stagecoaches ran consistently early, on time or early. The only complaint anyone could raise was that it took 20 days for the mail to get from the Mississippi River to California. The reason it took 20 days is that the Butterfield line was 2,800 miles long. It, it became known as a southern route because it, it crossed the, or it stayed at the border between the US and Mexico and became derided as the Oxbow route for its roundabout shape. When Russell set his sights on Butterfield, the Russell Majors and Waddell, through a subsidiary known as the Central Overland California Pikes Peak Express, was operating a stagecoach and mail service to Salt Lake City. Now the COC and PP took what came to be known as the Central Route, which is the route over South Pass. The distance to California on that route was 1,950 miles. In other words, just over 50%, just over half as long as a Butterfield route. So common sense seemed to dictate that Russell could deliver mail more quickly over the shorter route. The question was how best to prove he could do so. For some reason, he thought that just providing that service wasn't enough. He felt that he needed to do something spectacular to capture the imagination of the public and to sway congressional minds. And the answer he came up with was to add this faster Pony Express service to the existing COCMPP stagecoach service. And really, of all the possible solutions he might have chosen, this was probably the worst. Yes, it was fast. And yes, it was exciting. And yes, it got great headlines. But remember at the beginning when I told you that the Pony Express delivered mail in 10 days, except when it didn't? Well, on December 1st, Russell placed a notice in the Leavenworth newspaper stating that throughout winter, delivery times would be 15 days. And according to historian Leroy Haffin, actual delivery times were often even longer, which means that the Pony Express failed at both of its primary objectives, to prove it could, it could deliver mail faster in winter, even in winter, and to prove that it could keep the schedule even through winter. The irony here is that this, this very image of the Pony Express that graces statues, memorials, and monuments from the Mississippi River to the Golden Gate, this lone horse and rider is the exact reason why the Pony Express couldn't keep its 10-day schedule. Because no rider, no horse, not even a hippogriff, could make its way through the deep, or deep Wyoming snow. It needed a daily run of a team of animals to break the trail. So the snow was just as deep, fell just as deep in the Sierra Nevadas. But the year before, in 1859, silver had been discovered in Virginia City. And as a result, there were constant mule trains crossing the mountains between Placerville, California, and Virginia City, Nevada. Those broke the trail, tamped down the snow, and made it easier for the Pony Express horses. So you might say that while William Russell envisioned the Pony Express as a silver bullet, really he only ended up shooting himself in the foot. Because in addition to failing to prove that he could outperform the Butterfield Overland, he hastened the, he hastened the demise of Russell Majors and Waddell. It cost the firm $16 for every piece of mail it delivered, but the firm never charged more than $5 per letter. Russell Majors and Waddell sunk deeper into debt than mountain bike tires in East Kansas mud. <laughs> they were so desperate for money that on Christmas Eve 1860, William Russell was thrown in jail for embezzling government bonds, which had pledged as security for high interest loans. The code at all this drama is that just a few months later, Congress did approve a million dollar subsidy to deliver mail over South Pass. Not because it was faster or shorter, but in February 1860, the Texas legislature voted to secede from the Union. Shortly after, Texas Rangers shut down the Butterfield Line across that state. They raided the stations, they harassed passengers, and they interfered with the mail. So in other words, the central route wasn't the better route, it was the only route to get mail to the west. And the contract didn't go to the COC and PP, which was in disgrace because of Russell's bond embezzlement scandal. Instead, the government ordered Butterfield to relocate its line to the central route. So in order to expedite the move, they, they subcontracted, Butterfield subcontracted with the COC and PP to run the eastern half of the, of the trail. And, you know, the money was welcome. 
for Russell, but, but it was a far cry from the million dollar subsidy he'd hoped to gain and the monopoly on transportation he'd hoped to create. Which brings us to California. I realize I'm skipping a lot of territory here, but what I want to do is make sure that I get to the last myth I introduced above, the idea that Russell Majors and Waddell set up the Pony Express in order to help save the Union by keeping Californians gold tied with the northern states on the eve of the Civil War. Those of you who were at that Motilla Exchange demonstration last year may remember there was a gentleman who was narrating events and answering questions. He made that exact statement. And he was justified in doing so because many people believe that's true. But he was dead wrong. As I just explained, outlined, when we were 1,000 miles back at South Pass during winter, standing in the snow, the only reason Russell set the service up was to prove he could outperform the Butterfield Overland. In the words of Pony Express historians Raymond and Mary Lund Settle, quote, patriotic motives, which some writers ascribe to the promoters, had nothing to do with it. Today we would call it an intensive national ad advertisement campaign. Moreover, I just want to say that if the Pony Express played any role in keeping California loyal to the United States, then it's the biggest irony of the entire Pony Express saga, because the Pony Express was a pro-slavery institution from the top down. The owners, William Russell, Alexander Majors, William Bradford Waddell, all held slaves. Uh, again, in the words of, of Raymond and Mary Lund Settle, these three, quote, threw their weight as the most influential capitalists in the territory on the side of slavery. Another source states that, states that their success was entwined, deeply entwined, with their slaveholder status, and that they likely relied heavily on slave labor in their businesses. Of the three, William Russell was particularly sound on the goose, which was a phrase used in Bleeding Kansas for those who supported slavery. He joined the pro-slavery Law and Order Party when it formed in 1856 and served as its secretary. He was a signatory on a flyer that the party sent out, soliciting funds to support pro-slavery immigrants to move to Kansas to vote for slavery. Russell Majors and Waddell accepted funds on behalf of those immigrants. Pro-slavery mobs known as border ruffians boarded steamboats on the Missouri River. They would take any goods belonging to free staters and turn the free staters away from Kansas. Russell Majors and Waddell allowed the border ruffians to use their depots for selling these confiscated goods. The pro-slavery contingent wasn't limited to Russell Majors and Waddell. Senator Gwynn of California, the man often credited with talking William Russell into starting the Pony Express, brought slaves with him when he moved from Mississippi to California. He once argued in Congress that Southern states have a right to secede, quote, violently if necessary. Others include Ben Ficklin, Benjamin Ficklin, who was the supervisor of the entire Pony Express line, the notorious Jack Slade, division supervisor, late of Julesburg, and M. Jeffrey Thompson, who was the mayor of St. Joseph, he gave Russell Majors and Waddell the sweetheart deal to locate the Pony Express there. And hostility toward the United States didn't come just from the Confederate ranks. Station keepers and riders in Utah and eastern Nevada were Mormon, who as a group were antipathetical toward both sides. Joseph Smith had foretold the Civil War in 1832 and Brigham Young saw the coming of the war as fulfillment of his prophecy. He also saw the violence as retribution or payback for the persecution the Mormons had suffered. His policy was, quote, to stay neutral and pray both sides prevailed. In fact, Utah was the only state or territory that didn't supply troops to either side of the conflict. So given the pro-slavery stance of the leadership of the Pony Express, and the antipathy of the Mormons toward both sides, it's hard to imagine what would motivate any of these men to start or to support a service with the express purpose of delivering mail, to, delivering mail, of delivering California to the northern states on the eve of the Civil War in order to save it. The reason I've come here today is basically to say enough with the myths. The Pony Express did not save the United States. Russell Majors and Waddell weren't patriots. William Russell was an entrepreneurial genius and Alexander Majors was an estate. The men as a group 
were not teetotaling, God-fearing orphans, and their horses weren't semi-mythic beasts. Ever since Buffalo Bill created the comic book version of the Pony Express in order to up his street cred and sell more tickets to his Wild West show, it's been described as heroic, patriotic, and romantic. It's been hailed as uh, iconic, symbolic, and exemplary. Each grandiose description further obscuring rather than illuminating the singular accomplishment of the Pony Express, which is this. For a brief period of time, an army of people moved a small amount of mail across the Western United States as fast as humanly possible under exceedingly difficult circumstances. Riders braved long, lonely rides, often through barren terrain and harsh weather, extremely harsh weather. Station keepers endured loneliness, boredom, isolation, and sometimes grave personal danger to support them. All of them worked and kept at their work, even though the company they worked for was so broke and their pay so intermittent that they renamed the company from the California, Central Overland California Pikes Peak Express to clean out of cash and poor pay. They were mail carriers in the best sense of a tradition that dates at least as far back as the Angarium the Persian Pony Express from the 5th century BCE, about which the Greek historian Herodotus wrote, neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. And I think that, stripped of all the myths, is enough to still earn our respect today. Thank you. Thank you.